This morning we're going to look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And the title of the message is, uh, It's About Time. And uh, you know, it's that time of year again. How many of you have been invited to or have attended a graduation or a graduation party? So, you know, it's that time of year, right? It may be pre-K, it could be kindergarten, it could be fifth grade, it could be sixth grade, it could be middle school, it could be high school, or it could be college. There's a lot of them. Huh? It could be beauty schools. Okay. So, uh, at times like these, though, we frequently observe or, or say, where did the time go? Or we might say something like, my, how time flies. Somebody might even say, I remember when they were this high. We can hit the snooze button on the phone, maybe not on the literal clock anymore. We can hit the snooze, we can stop the stopwatch, we can turn off the timer, and we can run out of time. But the life clock keeps on ticking. It doesn't stop for anyone or for any reason. It just keeps going. We say, wait, wait, I need a little time here. It just keeps ticking. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a rough thing. Time is a commodity. It's a resource God gives us as stewards to invest in the redemption of other people. Something we use that he gives us for a purpose. Unlike the pay we receive on our jobs, we all get the same amount of time. Nobody gets more, nobody gets less. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, we all get the same. It's been said, time is money. Paul, who was a prisoner when he wrote this letter, speaks to us about how to spend or invest our time as stewards wisely. So let's read Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Act wisely toward outsiders, non-believers making the most of the time. And the word that's used there is actually a word that's translated redeem, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be what? Gracious. Seasoned with salt. So that you may know how you should answer each one or each person. Paul's instruction consists of, and now these aren't the points, but these are involved in what Paul's instruction is. Demanding discipleship, going anywhere to anyone, learning, redemptive relationships, helping people find forgiveness. People need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. Vicarious vulnerability. That's what the cross is all about. We, we, we sang about that, right? Leaving heaven to a cradle in the dirt. Vicarious vulnerability. Putting our lives on the line for the benefit of someone else. And effective evangelism. In other words, communicating, communicating the good news of Jesus Christ. I remember in Fort Worth, Texas, when we lived there, I was out working on my car, and uh, two guys came up and had a, had a little track. And they came up to me, and we began to chit-chat. And they gave me the track and said, you know, 
And I opened it up, and the words inside said, turn or burn. They didn't know if I was a believer or not. That message to me was not the good news. Now, we need to express the truth. But that was not extending to me an opportunity to find forgiveness and grace in my life. It was about, it made me feel like I don't meet your standard. And that's not communicating the gospel. As we fulfill the mission Christ has given us, time is one of the currencies we use. How do we invest it? Paul says, first of all, we spend time with outsiders. It's that simple. Sadly, in our Christian communities, we have formed cultures of separation and isolation. That doesn't fulfill the mission. There was an article in Christianity Today. It was published about, I mean, it's kind of old, but it was published in 2013. And it said, now we can analyze this and justify, but this is what, this is what was published. 20% of non-Christians in North America do not personally know any Christians. Paul says in this passage, we need to spend time with non-believers in order to invest in kingdom work. That's why, that, that's why we have time to make disciples. Isn't that what he said? Go into all the world In verse 6, it's not just about putting in time, but actually engaging them in conversation, dialogue, and activity. He says, let your speech always be gracious. You're talking with them. And you're talking with them in a certain tone. Seasoned with salt. Some of, I mean, that track was sort of like Food that was too salty, right? <laughs> but I like some salt on the food, don't you? I mean, it's like sometimes you, if you don't put it on there, somebody will complain and say, man, that was kind of bland. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase that can mean attractive. It doesn't mean that you're um, trying to impress anybody, but you are communicating the good news of Jesus Christ that communicates to them hope, forgiveness, grace, honesty, integrity, character, and eternal value. Seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Not me knowing that this is my, you know, I'm smart enough to know. No, it is following Christ in that extension to non-believers. And as I do that, as I intentionally do that, he will give me the words to say that I will know how to answer that person in accordance with how God is speaking to their heart. We need to spend time with non-believers in order to invest in kingdom work. Paul uses a term in verse 5 that in, in um, the version I have, it says, act wisely. The word is actually literally translated walk around. And then it, there's a, another word with that verb that says walk around towards, walk around to. It is intentionally walking toward the unbeliever. And he says, 
Walk toward them wisely. We can't live in the bubble of our holy huddles and spend our time wisely. Let me illustrate it this way. And we're going to use Pastor Ken's team here and, and, and the Buffalo Bills. So <laughs> let's say the Buffalo Bills are playing the Minnesota Vikings. Right? All right. And what happens in this game is Josh Allen called him out. The, the offense goes out there, huddle up. They get in their huddle. And they huddle up four different times. Never run a play. They just huddle up and talk about the play. And the whole game, they do that. Pastor Ken would be happy. Minnesota would win. <laughs> See, they got together. They got together. But it didn't do any good in the game. If we just meet in our holy huddles, we are not carrying out the Great Commission. If we choose to say, I will not, and if we, say, if we say, but if I go out there, the influence will be too great. Jesus didn't say that when he came to the cross. And then he said to those who wanted to follow him, take up your cross and follow me. We've got to be in the game. This, this culture of separation conflicts with Paul's and Jesus' use of time. Paul invested his time with non-believers. He did. He uses a shopping term here. He's, man, you know, well, shopping can wear you out, right? But Paul uses a shopping term, redeeming. He, Act wisely. Redeem. Take what you have, the resource you have, and buy with it. Invest with it in something. And what, what the Scripture is telling us, invest in something eternal. We all have the resource. We can't say, eh, you know, so-and-so has a lot more than I do. I just can't, you know. I got all these obligations, and I don't have anything... No, we all have the same time that God gives us. So Paul says, redeem the time. Buy something back. Bringing people back to their creator. That's what we're doing. God created them. The value of life, pro-life. God created. And in, as we are born and walk through this, we need a Savior. And the Creator is seeking to bring back the people to Himself. And we have the commodity of time to be involved in that process. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9, 11, 9 through 11, Paul makes interesting some, write something pretty interesting. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people where? Where? Of this world. When Paul wrote that, he said, don't associate with them. He says, I didn't mean the immoral people of this world. Or the greedy and swindlers of, or idolaters, otherwise you would have to what? Leave this world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be what? Now that gets tricky, right? I'm going to confess to you right now. I don't know 
how you set all this up without being legalistic and, 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 and you know, it turns into a mess. But he says, but he says, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister. That's talking about a, a fellow Christian. Not to associate, and, and that one is sexually immoral or greedy and idolater or verbally abusive or a drunkard. Or, there's a lot of things there. He's writing to Corinthians, you know, that church was like an American church. And he says, don't even eat with such a person. Now, I, again, I want to confess to you, that's a tough verse to discern and apply. But, it, but you can't deny his point. I didn't mean for you to isolate yourself from the world. You need to be careful how the, 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 the Christian community maintains its witness. Paul was in prison for investing his time with unbelievers. That's why he's writing from prison. And the results was investing. But you know what Paul would say? It's all worth it. More importantly, Jesus invested his time with outsiders. He says in Matthew 9, 12 through 13, And when you heard this in the conversation, he said, it's not those who are what? Well, another place he says righteous. It's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. In verse 13, he says, go and learn what this means, what he's getting ready to say. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call what? Who? The righteous, those who don't think they, or think they got it all figured out. But sinners, people who know they don't. In Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, this was Jesus' reputation. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners, Yet, the scripture says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. The wisdom that he was using there. But his reputation was, he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. How far is that going to get you in church? Sometimes our value system and the things that we set up are contrary to what God is intending to do with us. And it's a very scary thing. And it makes us vulnerable. And it can be hurtful and sacrificial. But let's not kid ourselves. The cross was not pleasant. But it was important. There may be people that say to you, what are you hanging around with them for? And the motive of your heart might be that they might find forgiveness, grace, Christ. I'm not talking about you go out and get drunk with them. But because they get drunk, I hope you don't run away when they sober up. Woman at the well. John 4.4. 4. It says, he had to travel through Samaria. You go, what? <laughs> what kind of passage is that? Well, he was a Jew, right? And many of you know this. 
a true Jew avoided going through Samaria, right? Because Samaritans were considered compromisers from the exile. And they didn't truly hold. So if you associated with them, you were compromising. But that word that says he had to travel through is a word that carries the idea of a moral necessity. It was essential and it was part of that he go through Samaria and he met this woman. And she became an evangelist, right? Because he changed her life. The Gadarene demoniac, Matthew 8, 18. When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. And what was happening there was Jesus told the disciples, he gave the order to go to the other side, a Gentile country, not Jewish country, Gentile country. And when he went to the other side, he met the Gadarene demoniac and brought healing to that demoniac that no one else could do. And when he did, when he, brought, when he made a change in that life and brought peace, forgiveness, they asked him to leave. They were scared of him. But he was walking toward non-believers. Not only do we spend time with non-believers, but we spend the time wisely. And I want to share with you um, a story about a man named Harold. <coughs> when I pastored up in Carthage, New York, uh, I came out of seminary. And uh, so first church, and uh, so I got on the field, was going to make visits to church members. Harold was married to Bev. Bev was a, a really faithful church member. She was a fine Christian lady. So I scheduled a time to go visit Bev and Harold. He had a salvage yard. Uh, and uh, so I went out. And I went out. As this young graduate from seminary, first time pastor, I had an agenda. And I was going to go out and I was going to share the gospel with Harold. He, was, he didn't come to church. So I went out. We sat in the kitchen. Bev made some coffee. We sat there and drank some coffee. And I was working on that conversation. I finally got it to where I thought it needed to be and asked Harold, have you, has there ever been a time in your life when you received Jesus Christ? And Harold looked at me and said, yeah, I think so. Didn't I, Bev? And he was squirming a little. And so uh, I asked him, you know, if he could, and I just kept going. Can you tell me about it? He was so uneasy. But he was, he was a gentleman. I mean, he didn't. My dad probably would have said, you can leave. <laughs> but he didn't. So we talked a little, a little more about it. And when I left, it's like, I don't know if he is or not. But I found out that and I tried to continue a conversation with Harold. And I found out he goes to a diner at 5 o'clock in the morning. He meets with people down at the diner, a little small diner. And uh, so I asked him if I could just go down there sometime with him. So I said, sure. So I went down and had some bacon and eggs. They were talking. I was meeting some people and didn't know anybody except him. But then I continued to go. And uh, pretty soon Harold started coming to church periodically. 
mostly on Sunday night. We had, you know, it was the day when you had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. So he, he would come on Sunday night because it would be a smaller crowd, right? He wasn't going to come to prayer meeting. But he came on Sunday night periodically, sit in the last pew, back there about where Don is. and, and be, So Bev and, Bev and Harold would be back there. And periodically came. And then one Sunday night, unbeknownst to Bev or to me, gave an invitation, and Harold walked down the aisle and accepted Christ. And then he became involved. He was, you know, like I said, he had a salvage yard. We had a church van. He became involved in keeping that thing going so we could do ministry. He wasn't looking for the glitter, the glamour, or the big thing. And... Uh, so I tell that story to say this. There's a lot of time that I have not invested wisely. I'll confess to you that. And maybe it's been too long since I've done a wise investment. But that investment felt wise to me. And it was about God speaking to him where he was not about me making the point. How are you investing your time? First of all, do you view your time as a commodity that God has given you as a steward? Or are you going to spend it however you want to? Are you using that time to invest it with non-believers? Who is it that you're with? That God is extending the hope of forgiveness through you because you know it to someone who doesn't and it doesn't make them worse than you or less valuable than you. It just makes them someone like I was that didn't know. Are you involved in the holy huddle but not running the plays in the game? Talk about it. We talk about it. We talk about it. But then when it comes to the application, it's kind of difficult. Even the most simple things that we know. Have you found that investing time this way involves demanding discipleship, redemptive relationships, vicarious vulnerability, put yourself in positions that are difficult for the benefit of others, and effective evangelism? It's about time. The time God gives us as stewards, and all of us have the same amount. So as we go from here, we're going to invest. What's our investment? And sometimes the investment seems like, wow. I mean, if you're invested in the stock market and you open your statement, I mean, recently, it's like, oh, gee, I don't even want to look. And some people will tell you, don't look. But stay in it for the long haul. Is my investment of time as a steward of God, even though it hurts, even though it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, I'm using it the way I believe he wants me to. Toward, I'm walking toward that unbeliever that he brings into my sphere of influence for his glory. I just ask us all to consider that as we go from here today. I want to say a word of prayer, and then we're going to go into the Lord's Supper. Okay? So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your truth. I thank you, God, that you don't cast us aside, that you teach us, 
and you have been a model for us in your, your life, Jesus, when you came about what it means to be an instrument in your hands for salvation purposes, for eternal purposes. And so, God, I pray as we go that we'll not judge one another necessarily, that we will support one another, encourage one another, and pray for one another as we go about your business using the time you give us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.